Hi, this is Maya Hollingshed. I am the adult services librarian at the Walden Mount Pleasant Library. And today I have local historian Damon Fordham about his um, independent author process and why did he decide to become an independent author. So um, introduce yourselves and give, give the titles of your books and tell us um, a little bit what your books are about. Okay. I am an adjunct professor of history at Charleston Southern University as well as the Citadel. I do a walking tour called True Stories of Black South Carolina. I have a YouTube channel called The American Storyteller. I lecture uh, all over the place and appear in documentaries regarding African American history. So I'm very happy to stand here and talk to you today. Now, my three books are as follows. The first two were two books on South Carolina's African American history. The first was True Stories of Black South Carolina, which was written in 2008. And that was largely a compilation of lesser known stories about South Carolina's African American history. Things like the story behind Samuel Smalls, who was the real Porgy behind Porgy and Bess, the events behind Martin Luther King's visit to Charleston on July the 30th, 1967, the story of a black policeman in Mount Pleasant during the early, the late 1800s and early 1900s, and the time that these African-Americans actually lynched a black man in central South Carolina, Lindsey Graham's hometown, in 1888 over the molestation of his daughter, and he actually went to court and lived to tell about it, and, you know, a lot of things like that. Then uh, I did a second book called Voices of Black South Carolina the following year, which told the story of, among other things, six brave African-American low country leaders who stood up to the South Carolina government when they tried to make segregation the law of the state, as well as how these leaders established a progressive system in South Carolina during Reconstruction, only to see it get taken away, as well as the stories of uh, leaders such as Elizabeth Evelyn Wright, the founder of Voorhees College, and the great Mrs. Set, Tim Point Set Clark, Charleston's major uh, female civil rights leader. So in 2012, I did my third book, which was Mr. Potts and Me, it was on a different track. It was a semi-autobiographical semi novel about a little kid who is bad and, and, in, and disinterested in sports and everybody thinks he's weird and he's into the books, i.e. me as a child, and how, he, how he's mentored by this older man who tells him all these wonderful stories about uh, African-American history and folklore and how those stories sort of help him into manhood. And that was loosely based on my relationship with my dad, as well as an older man in our community named Walter Snipe. Those are the three books I've written so far. And right now I'm working on an expansion of the story of the six black leaders who tried to stop segregation before it started in South Carolina. And I have an unpublished sequel to Mr. Potts and Me as we speak. So that's what I've done book wise. Okay, great, thanks. Um, when did you first realize that you wanted to become an author? Oh, I'm glad you asked me that. Well, I've been a reader all my life, literally, uh, since I was about three or four years old. And my dad bought me some Charlie Brown books from the old W.T. Grant's uh, uh, department store in Mount Pleasant back around when I was four years old. But in at the University of South Carolina, I read a book called American uh, Splendor by Harvey Picar. And it was the foundation of what you would now call a graphic novel. And his stories in that book were so fascinating to me because it would be another 20 years before I'd actually go to Cleveland. And at that time, I knew very little about Jewish life. But, I fe but the fact that Harvey Picar could take me into his world of being growing up Jewish in Cleveland with his stories, even though I knew little about that kind of background, the way he was able to draw me into that struck up something in me that said, you know, maybe I could do this too. And a lot of people have said since then that they've gained a lot of insight into the world that I understand through my writing. So my only uh, regret with that was that when I did, by the time I went to Cleveland, Harvey Peeker himself had passed. So I never got to tell him how much he inspired me with that. But I'm just hopeful that I'm able to inspire a lot of other people in the same way. Great. Um, 
Next question is, how long does it take you to write your books? And I know you do a lot of research. This is history. And sometimes when I visit the main library, you're in the South Carolina room doing your research. So we, I want to know, and probably the audience also wants to know about that as well. Well, it depends because it doesn't take me very long to write a nonfiction book because once I know what I'm doing and know where to find the research, I'm just off to the races when it comes to that. So it's just a matter of making the necessary arrangements with the publisher to do that with nonfiction. Fiction is another story because I started writing Mr. Potts and Me in 1991 when I visited my father's grave on February 14th, 1991 was the seventh anniversary of his death. And I thought, you know, it'd be a terrible thing if my dad's stories were to die with him. So I created that whole uh, frame story about uh, Mr. Potts and the young boy based on my youth. But, it, it, but some of the shorter stories appeared on a few internet sites in the late 90s and early 2000s, but no publisher was interested until 2012. And so I'm looking for another one now to uh, do the sequel, but I'll put that on the back burner while I'm working on the nonfiction book. All right. Um, so in other words, fiction, so the short answer to that is nonfiction takes a lot shorter time than fiction. Okay, gotcha. All right. Why did you take the independent route instead of going to traditional route, going with one of the big five publishers? And did you think about going the traditional route as in trying to get into the big five as well? Well, the big five simply just wasn't an option for me because I just didn't know anybody in those type of circles. So what I did was I went through a couple, so most of all the publishers that I've gone through have been local. You see the uh, Arcadia, which was uh, used to be the History Press, they took care of the nonfiction books and I published the fiction one through the Evening Post Press. So, I, so in a sense, I went through a semi-traditional route of going through local publishers, but as for self-publishing, I was never really interested in that because I know that that costs a lot, a lot of money. And when you go through that other right, you get paid. So, uh, I mean, if people want to self-publish and have the control of that, I don't discourage that. It just wasn't something that I was considering at that point because I figured that if I went through the route of established publishers, the books would be better known and be able to better get out there. And I was not that well known at that point yet. So. I just figured the way I went about it, uh, it turned out okay. Okay, great. Which, um, which leads me to my next question. Since you went with the local um, publishers, were there publishers on staff? Or did you have to hire your own editor and then no, give it to them? No, they did all of that. But I was in close consultation with their editors because, for example, uh, it, because, for example, if there were some things in the edit that I just thought were just way off the track, I would let them know that. But uh, they were, but for the most part, they were pretty cooperative with me. So, especially with the nonfiction books, I was very pleased with the editing of those. Oh, good, good. Um, what What is one of the most surprising things you have learned about creating books and self publishing? Well, I wasn't. I didn't self publish. Well, kind of. Well, or going through, well, well, not really much self-publishing or going through the, the, um, the book process. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you one of the most rewarding things that happened through that. Well, a number of the rewarding things that happened to that was when I did the nonfiction books, meeting the descendants of some of the people who I wrote about whose stories were lesser known. Those were very gratifying and inspiring to me. And they were pleased that I was able to get their stories out there and I got to meet them through writing those books. That was particularly gratifying. But one thing in particular that I must mention, they, with the Mr. Potts book, there was a young lady who was on Facebook whose daughter was being bullied at the time. And I reached out to her. And one of the side issues of the Mr. Potts book was the fact that this kid was bullied. And I went through that badly when I was uh, in my in my uh, early teens and in the earlier part of my childhood. So I gave the young girl a copy of my book and it really motivated and inspired her. And now she's a young teenage entrepreneur. So I think that that was perhaps the most rewarding experience in regard to my books. Okay, cool. And last question is, 
what advice would you give for authors slash writers who want to publish? Well, I would give them I would give them some good advice, some several things of good advice. For one thing, in order to write well, you have to read a lot. You have to, and I would strongly suggest that if they want to write uh, poetry books or novels or nonfiction books, to heavily read books in the genres that you're interested in, so you could it can give you an understanding of how to construct your works. Okay, and secondly. Be willing to do a lot of research before you go with a publisher. Talk to people who were who were involved with them first, and so forth, and so you'll know which publishers to go to and which publishers to avoid. So, and then and then too, don't be afraid to ask difficult questions regarding money. You can't be too shy and do that too. And I'll and I'll also close with this anecdote. A few years ago, when I uh, did one of the books, I was on t I was on a television show, and a somewhat famous person was on the same show with me, and we were in the green room before the telecast, and I started so I started star tripping on the particular celebrity, and the celebrity said, "Mr. Fordham, I know who you are. I and my wife and I have your book." And I said, "You have my book?" And he <laughs> looked at me and said. Mr. Fordham, I presume the reason that you write books is so that people will read them. I'm like, oh, okay. Now, the moral to that story is as follows, is that when, when you get recognition for your book, accept it, because this is why you did that in the first place. Whenever people tell you this nonsense about, well, you know, I never dreamed that I would get this kind of success, that is a load of garbage. This is what people strive for when they try to put their stuff out there. Nobody puts their stuff out there to be an unknown. So when you get accolades and awards and recognition from the public, accept it. Great. Damon, thank you so much for interviewing today. And you gave a lot of great advice for Indie Authors Week, and we appreciate it. You're very welcome. You have a great day. You too.